Hello and welcome to today's web seminar. Today we will be discussing CSA, controlling your scores. This educational transportation web seminar is brought to you by Interstate Motor Carriers Capacity Agency LLC with special guest speaker, attorney Doug Marcello from Marcello and Cavisto. Before we begin, a little bit about the technology we'll be using today. All of your lines have been muted for the duration of the web seminar. You can enter any questions you have via the question box or chat box and we'll queue them up for Doug at the conclusion of the presentation. You can also slide the GoToWebinar box closed by clicking the double arrow or orange arrow, but do not click the black X or you will exit the web seminar. So without further ado, Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. We cannot overstate the impact of CSA on our industry. Right or wrong, it has become the yardstick against which company safety has been measured. The most notable use of CSA has been the by the FMCSA. It is their gauge for determining against which companies to focus their enforcement efforts. Enforcement ranging from letters to those companies whose scores in a basic are above the DOT established threshold to determinations as to which companies to audit, either full or focused. CSA has also become a factor for brokers and shippers who live in fear of legal liability for assigning loads to carriers with excessive CSA scores. In fact, many shippers include CSA litmus tests in their freight contracts. They expressly disqualify carriers whose scores exceed a predefined level from hauling for that shipper. CSA scores have also hit the radars of insurers using those scores in their evaluation of a carrier's risk based upon a perceived correlation with their CSA score. The validity of using a CSA score to evaluate the quality of a company, a trucking company in particular, is questionable. High scores in the hours of service basic may not be indicative of a crash risk if that score is an accumulation of form and manner violations rather than violations of the 11 or 14 hour rule. There is an inherent inequity for the carriers in high traffic areas who are exposed to a greater possibility of accidents or violations. There is a large number, if not majority, of companies that don't even have a CSA score. Many misunderstand the ranking system that places your company within a supposed peer group upon which your score is actually based. This gives brokers, shippers, and insurers a misperception as to how you stand in reality to the industry as a whole. Regardless of what we think of it, the reality is that CSA is the system that controls. And whether or not they correctly understand CSA, shippers, brokers, and insurance will dredge you by it. Until it changes, we have to deal with it. We just have to make sure that our scores are as low as possible. Everyone talks about CSA scores as if they represent the accumulation of points. In truth, CSA scores are really a ranking. A ranking as to how you compare to the other companies. In effect, CSA is akin to the story of the two fellows who are out camping for the weekend. One comes into the tent, puts on his sneakers. The first one in the, who's already in the tent said, what are you doing? The guy putting on his sneakers said, there's a bear coming down the path. The first fellow says, you think you can outrun a bear? No, says the fellow with the sneakers on. I can outrun you, though. That's the key. You don't have to be perfect. Like the guy with the sneakers, you just have to outrun the other trucking companies, the trucking companies within your group. You just have to make sure that you stand better than they do. So who's in your group? Well, that depends on which basic you are looking at. With regard to some of the basics, you're compared to companies based upon the number of units your company operates. These are the vehicle-oriented basics, vehicle maintenance and hazmat. The number of units is taken from your MCS 150. For that reason, you need to make sure that the number of units you report to the Department of Transportation on your MCS 150 is both accurate and up-to-date. In other basics, which are driver inspection oriented, your score is determined by the number of roadside inspections you undergo. These basics are the hours of service compliance, driver fitness, and controlled substance alcohol basics. Now, for the last two of the elements of the SMS, the unsafe driving basic and the crash indicator, your score is determined by a hybrid calculation using the number of power units 
as well as the vehicle miles traveled. These numbers upon which the groupings are based are very important. As the basis of your grouping within each basic is recalculated each month, this is one of the reasons why your score may go up despite having fewer, if any, new violations. Considering that all but two of the rankings are based, at least in part, on your number of power units, accuracy and timing of your reporting on an MCS 150 is very important. So how do we keep the scores down? First of all, one of the things we want to look at is proactive hiring. Lower scores start with hiring. While advertisements for mutual funds will tell you that past performance is no indication of future income, the PSP, Pre-Employment Screening Program, report as to a driver's prior roadsides, is probably going to give you a pretty good basis for analyzing their scoring risk once you hire them. You don't pick up the points that are already on the record of the driver you hire. However, if that driver racks up points during their tenure with you, no matter how short that tenure may be, you're stuck with those points for two years. And for the first six months, they're tripled. You can see how your applicant's prior CSA record stands by utilizing the pre-employment screening program, the PSP. You can only access this information in conjunction with their application for employment. To enroll, what you want to do is go to the PSP website, www.psp.com fmcsa.dot.dot.gov. Now, there's a $10 fee for each driver report you obtain, but for that $10, you get valuable insight into the roadside reports of your applicant's PSP. You'll be able to look at their history of violations. Do they have a record of form and manner violations, failure to secure loads? not wearing a seat belt, not carrying a medical card, or are they violations that are more troublesome, more problematic, such as reckless driving or 11 or 14 hour violations, or even jumping in out of service? If so, once you get to look at what the violations are on their PSP record, you can determine if these are the type of errors for which you can coach, educate, and train to avoid these mistakes in the future or whether these are viewed by you as an irreversible pattern, something that you're buying into if the drivers hide by you. Go into it with your eyes open and your CSA score in mind. Even if you determine that the applicant is hireable, PSP gives you an opportunity to address the deficiencies reflected on the PSP score and closely monitor performance. You'll have the opportunity once you see what are the issues that they've had in the past with regard to PSP, what are the prior roadside violations they have, to address these both in terms of a training program, focused training, and perhaps even a ride-along driver manager or probation period once they come on with you in order to disavow the new driver of these bad habits. PSP can particularly be valuable if you use owner-operators. Not only will you have a perspective on their driving habits, but you'll get much needed insight into the condition and maintenance of their equipment before they sign on with you. For existing drivers, be proactive. First, make sure they know why CSA is important to them and why they need to care. Make sure they know this is not just a company problem, but it can ultimately mean their jobs. Jobs by freight lost or insurance issues raised. Additionally, they need to be made aware of and fully cognizant that their personal scores are kept by the Department of Transportation and a driver system. These are kept by the DOT for three years, and that any future employer can review those scores by submitting and requesting a PSP before they're hired for a future job. It's their record. It's their profession. Second, make sure they know how CSA works. Make sure they know how they can get points, how they're assigned, and what violations and road signs are the most important and to which the most points are assigned. In order to help you provide this training to your drivers, we have posted two five-minute narrated PowerPoints on our webpage, www.cdl-law.com. These PowerPoints can be opened in PowerPoint, played on the B2 
begin from the beginning slide cast and will be narrated so that in five minutes your drivers can have some background on what it is that's involved with CSA. One provides drivers with an introduction to CSA, what are the basics, the other one explained how it operates. Whatever method to educate the drivers you use, teach early, teach often. The more they understand about how it works and what it means to them individually, the better the foundation for effective compliance. Also make the CSA score a company-wide campaign. While the emphasis starts on the drivers, it goes far beyond that to multiple areas within your trucking company. For example, it's just as important to explain CSA, how it works and the importance to the mechanics in the shop, just as much as the drivers, because it's their inspection and care of the vehicles that will drive the vehicle maintenance score as well. Preach to the drivers the importance of attention to detail. Again, your scale score is in comparison with other companies. There are certain events that will result in points that are beyond you and your driver's control. For example, when a light goes out and suddenly burns off when your truck's going down the road, this is an item over which you and your driver generally have no immediate control. That'll happen to both the other companies as well as yourself. But the difference in the scores and how you exceed the companies in your peer group, and that's the ranking that drives the CSA scores, how you improve on that is by focusing on the details that are within your control and be obsessed with focusing on those details. Pre-trip inspections must be more than 15 minutes logged by the driver. They must make sure that the vehicle is in shape from lights to brakes before they hit the road. Similarly, they must make sure that their logs are not only up to date, but the required information is included so that they don't get hit with a form and manner violation once they're out on the road. At roadside inspections, make sure your drivers keep their seat belts on until approached by the inspector so that there's no misunderstanding as to whether or not they were actually using it at the time they were driving. <clears throat> the key is avoid hemorrhaging cheap points with form and manner and other mistakes that with attention to detail can be avoided. The key is to focus on the details that will differentiate you from the, the others. From your perspective, review your scores on a monthly basis, and analyze your driver's pattern of points. In which of the basics are they scoring the highest? Are there any particular recurring violations within that basic? Is there a theme to the points that are being assigned? If so, that must be the point of emphasis until the score and those points are eliminated. One company related to me one time that they were scoring high in the medical category. Their drivers had all their DOT physicals and had them in a timely basis. The problem was that they were lax on carrying their medical cards. The result was a soaring score that put them above the threshold in that area. As a result, the company introduced a policy which provided that a driver could be asked to show his medical card upon demand by anyone in the company, from the CEO to the receptionist, from the director of safety to the newest mechanic. No card, first time, suspension second time fired. When we're dealing with a matter of such importance, sometimes drastic actions are required. The bottom line, monitor your scores and attack the problems. Another reason to check your scores each month is to make sure that the points are correctly assigned. Think about it. Your points are the product of reports that are generated at the roadside inspection. Your scores are ultimately generated as a product of the monotonous data entry of those scores. The potential for mistakes is great. They are frequently identified by companies that monitor their scores on a regular basis. Companies have found that errors occurred ranging from double entry of the same violation to mistakes in typing in someone else's DOT number that results in it being put on your score by the errant DOT number being yours. It's bad enough dealing with points that are assigned to you at roadside inspections. It's even worse to have your score inflated by points that are erroneously attributed to your company. The time-weighted system of CSA requires that you check it monthly. Remember, for each month you allow an erroneous score to languish on your SMS, your scoring system, those points are multiplied by three for the first six months. You need to get them off fast. Consistent with this, make sure your drivers provide you with their roadside inspection reports. This provides you with a heads up regarding any points. This also gives you a basis for comparison with your SMS score. 
you should be able to identify and recognize any points that show up on your score based upon the roadside reports that you have. Additionally, you should be able to identify and make sure that the clean violations are recognized as well. Even more important, getting the roadside reports promptly puts you in a position to challenge any improper or incorrect assessment of points. As you're surely aware, just because someone calls it a violation at a roadside doesn't make it so. Instead, the alleged violation could be the product of a misinterpretation of a regulation or misinspection of the condition of the truck. Whether it's a double assessment or a wrong interpretation, you can challenge the assessment by use of the data queue system. Data queue system is the government system by which you submit a challenge. The challenge is submitted to the designated office in the state where the violation occurred. You get started with the data queue system by registering. This will put you in a position to file a data queue as soon as you're in a position for a challenge. There are five types of matters that can be challenged on data queue. Crash events, inspection report events, DOT audit slash investigations, registration and insurance, household good complaints. Let's look at the two that we're focusing on today, crash events and inspection reports. Crash events can be challenged on several bases that it was assigned to the wrong carrier or driver, one of those clerical mistakes we talked about, that it was not reportable in the first place, that the crash was a duplicate, again, clerical mistake we talked about, that there's incorrect crash information. Now, you can also challenge whether or not that crash was preventable. However, this data queue will not be upheld as there's no finding or determination of fault that's being made in the process. This challenge would be for statistical purposes only. Moving on to inspection reports, challenges of an inspection report can again include that it was an incorrect violation, that it was assigned to the wrong carrier or driver, that there was an inspection report missing, that it is a duplicate inspection report, or that the inspection report contains incorrect information. In challenging and in firing a challenge, particularly where you challenge an inspection report with regard to a violation, present the information as if you were submitting a case in court. As in court, the key to challenging it is evidence, it's proof. Don't just submit a challenge for the sake of doing so. Make it a quality submission founded on evidence. Think about it. You have to overcome the ruling of the inspecting officer. You must present proof that the inspection report is not correct and that the points should be removed. This starts with driver training again. Make them aware of what they need to, to do at the roadside when there's a write-up and that they need to treat it the same as they would an accident. They need to document the matter then and there. Documentation and pictures, photographs are key. Take a photograph of the allegedly improper part. Make sure that there's no question that you're presenting an accurate depiction of the vehicle on the date of the inspection. Eliminate any argument or implication that the photo does not depict the item that was inspected on the date of that roadside. Also be prepared to provide support for your position by referencing the CSA interpretations. It's well worth the cost and effort to join CVSA and stay versed on the later, latest vehicle standards. While you must treat the proof in a data queue the same as you would a court case, a not guilty decision in a court case on any tickets from that roadside will not automatically get the points off your record. For example, let's assume that you were written up on the roadside for a chafed air hose. You went to court and you fought the ticket and won. Those points come off your CSA score, right? And not so fast, my friend. A, DO, a data queue challenge will not automatically be granted based upon winning the hearing on the ticket. That's not to say that presenting the same or similar proof that you did at the hearing will not carry the day in the data queue challenge. And the addition of the not guilty will be another matter to be considered. Winning the court case is not an automatic win on the data queue challenge. File the data queue challenge promptly. The FMCSA is moving to establish uniform time periods for submitting a challenge from state to state. When enacted, it will provide you two years to do so and three years for your driver to do so. You should never wait that long. Time should never be an issue. You should and you need to file your data queue challenge as soon as possible. First of all, the reviewing administrator is going to go back to the investigating officer to see if there's validity and what the facts that he recalls is. 
the longer you wait, the less chance there is that you're going to be able to get the data involved on that. But more importantly, and the reason for you to act promptly, is that the points are time weighted. Think about it. For the first six months, you're going to have triple the number of points based on the time weighting system. They are most impactful when they're first imposed. Why live with them on your record, let alone time weighted, because you dragged on filing your data queue challenge? Act promptly. Your score impacts many facets of your business. From CSA scrutiny to allocations of loads by shippers and brokers, control your scores. Start with hiring decisions, continue with education of your drivers and others in your company, continuously monitor and challenge those you feel are improperly assigned. It's in your control. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Doug. We have uh, a very large audience today who's asked many, many questions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, however, if there are any questions we can't get to, uh, please reach out to Doug or to Craig Weindorf at Interstate Motor Carriers, and we will try to get a uh, response to you as promptly as possible. So first question we have, is it mandatory to review a driver's PSP at the time of hire? Uh, it's not required, however, it's a good idea to do so. Uh, as I said before, first you can pick up what the driver's habits and patterns have been with regard to their CSA scores. Uh, also, as an aside, it's a good way to verify prior employment because if you see on their PSP a roadside listed with a company that's not on your uh, employment application, uh, that can give you an indication that there might be an issue there as well. Another related question, with regard to PSP scores, what is a good threshold or target when hiring a new driver? I, I, I would think that you would look less at the threshold than you would at the pattern and the nature of the violations. Uh, the more serious violations that we talk about, somebody jumps a roadside, uh, reckless driving, those would, I believe, automatically set off red flags for you. Uh, where they have an accumulation of others that are more uh, uh, non-egregious offenses, then I think you look at it in terms of are these the type of things that we can train out of the person or monitor as we go along. Rather than a rigid uh, standard, I would say you need to analyze each one and look at what, what's the nature of the violations and how frequently have they been. Several people have asked if you could share uh, your website address and the location of the, the video files that you brought up earlier um, once again. Be glad to, John. Uh, that is www.cdl-law.com. Uh, when you go there, click on the videos page. Uh, it'll take you down. There are uh, two narrated uh, PowerPoint presentations that if you uh, show them uh, from the beginning, uh, it'll be the narration will come up. We also have two from uh, that we did with regard to the hours of service changes, uh, one on the eight-hour uh, break requirement and the other on the new 34-hour restart. Great. Thank you. The uh, next question I have here is how common are the clerical errors you talked about? Uh, more common than you think. Uh, in companies and reviewing their records, it is surprising how many times they've picked up errant entries uh, that they're living with. Uh, and it's a matter of something you should keep in mind and, and uh, keep an eye on, as I said, on a monthly basis. Uh, you'd be surprised how often it occurs. Great. Thank you. Uh, next one, what is the success rate of data queue challenges? I, I, the numbers that I've heard from the various administrations are, are rather low, uh, but I think that's a function of many carriers uh, filing challenges uh, without giving the uh, data queue reviewers uh, something to work with in terms of facts and evidence. Uh, I think the key is pick your shots, support it well, uh, and proceed forward at that point. The next question is, do you feel that over time and with a greater accumulation of data, CSA will become more accurate with regard to the correlation between uh, SMS scores and safety culture? The long pause tells you something. 
that I just did. Uh, I think that's hard to project. Uh, I, th I think that CSA is always described by the FMCSA as a continuing process that's been changed many times. Uh, within the last year, a number of studies have come out um, both correlating and finding there's a lack of correlation between uh, uh, various aspects of the scores and what they're trying to produce. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, all we can say is uh, these are the rules of uh, what we have to follow at this point, uh, and we do the best we can to make do with that situation. The next question is, if a driver receives a warning for speeding due to an inaccurate speedometer, would this count against their CSA? It, it, the answer is, it, it will all be determined how it's written up on the roadside report. Uh, if they're given a warning for a uh, air speedometer and there's no write-up on the CSA on the uh, roadside inspection report, it will not go against the CSA score. If it's written up as a speed violation uh, or an equipment violation for having an air speedometer, then that's something that would show up on their CSA report. Well, thank you once again, Doug, for today's presentation, and we'd also like to thank Interstate Motor Carriers for sponsoring this Educational Transportation Web Seminar. Uh, we hope that all of you enjoyed the content. With that, today's web seminar is now ending. We hope you all have a great day.